Hey, Professor Laycock, how are you? Doing good, yeah. So I just want to say first, uh, thanks for meeting. I watched a couple interviews, actually got um, two of your books. Oh, and, thank you. Yeah, no problem. I, th I thought it was interesting. And actually on the back of um, Speak of the Devil, it has like a blurb from Stephen Prothero. And I, I actually, um, I have his book, God is Not One. And I always thought that was interesting to read it for class. So I wanted to know if I could kind of uh, have you start and just kind of give me a background on yourself and uh, your work. Um, my name is Joseph Laycock. I am an associate professor of Texas, or so associate professor of religious studies at Texas State University. Um, we recently started the new major here. So I am the program coordinator trying to, to get this up and running. Um, and as a researcher, I'm a scholar of new religious movements. New religious movements is what we used to call uh, cults in the media. Um, these are not groups that are necessarily um, doing anything uh, dangerous or, or untoward or brainwashing or anything like that. Uh, but what they do all have in common is they are sort of marginalized and alternative and misunderstood. Um, they, they may be doing good things or bad things. Uh, but I feel that it's important to study these groups, even though they're small, um, for a lot of reasons, but if for no other reason than uh, if the public is really worried that a group is dangerous, there's there's no better reason to study it. And we really need to have accurate uh, information about it. So uh, that's the work and the, the, the scholars that I'm in dialogue with uh, concentrate on. Um, so very uh, much related, uh, as far as I can tell from uh, what I've learned about you, you are a Christian, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my wife and I are um, are Catholic. We were both raised Catholics. And um, yeah, we, we got married in the Catholic Church, which was a colossal undertaking. <laughs> I don't think people have any idea how difficult it is to have a, a, a by the book canonically viable Catholic wedding. But uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we did it. On that note, what kind of made you interested in um not just um some of these other movements but satanism specifically because when i first actually came across you it was um can't remember his name genetically modified skeptic that's it yeah yeah that's it. um well i mean I'm, I'm not actually all that interested in satanism per se um you know the the, the sort of history of modern satanism begins in 1966 with anton LaVey. Uh, he's a very interesting guy, uh, you know, creative guy. Uh, but I wasn't particularly interested in that. Although, um, you know, I, I did write a book about the claim in the 80s that Dungeons and Dragons was satanic. So I did have a background in moral panic and the idea that kind of uh, Satanists are hiding under our beds, right? This was all in um, the most recent season of Stranger Things that kind of gave a lot of people a refresher about what it was like to be a teenager in the in, in the 80s. I got interested in the satanic temple specifically uh, because they were doing something that Satanists had never done before. You know, they were going out and demanding basically the same access to the public square that American Christians basically take for granted, right? And so um, I first really noticed them when they said, we want to build a statue of the devil, of, of Baphomet, to put up at the Oklahoma State Capitol. And here in Texas, our capital does have a Ten Commandments monument, and it's a rather interesting Supreme Court case that said that that was was allowed. So I was familiar with this, um, and I called Lucian Greaves, and I just said, "Are you serious? You you really going to build a statue?" And he said, "Well, we we crowdsource the money, and we can't give it back. So if I don't build a statue of the devil with it, I'm defrauding people. So I must go forwards, right? I, I can't get out of this." Um, and so I, I published this for the online magazine, Religion Dispatches, and my editor said, uh, hey, people love the antics of these Satanists. You know, if they do anything else, uh, uh, let me know. Uh, and so I kept covering some of their different campaigns for, for years and sort of watched this group evolve. Uh, but people kept telling me, you know, oh, it's such a funny scam or they're so obviously trolls or things like this. And what I saw was this, this, these people are actually very serious. Um, regardless of how serious they were when they started, they're very serious about it. Now they're actually willing to risk their lives. I mean, somebody tried to set fire to their headquarters while people were asleep inside of it. You know, I mean, that's a very serious crime. It's lucky nobody was was killed. Um, and so I decided to write a book about it. But what interests me is not so much Satanism per se, um, but the way that by demanding 
uh, uh, th these kinds of political rights, these Satanists have forced a conversation about what actually is religion, like what, what actually makes something a religion as opposed to a political view or a philosophy or any number of other things. This is a question that religious studies scholars pose all the time, but it's hard for us to get our students to take that question seriously because normally there's nothing at stake in that question. It's an academic question. The Satanic Temple shows, well, no, like whether or not you, you know, can get an abortion may come down to <laughs> what, what counts as a religion and, and, and what doesn't. And then the other thing is um, religious freedom. Uh, Americans love to talk about religious freedom, uh, but since the Satanic Temple has come along, some Christians have said things like, well, I don't like religious freedom. Religious freedom is bad if it means that the Satanists can, can do what they want. And I find this kind of ironic because, as Christians know, in the book of Job, this is Satan's job. Is he supposed to test you, right? Anybody can say, I love God. Anybody can say, I love religious freedom. But do you really love it when it's becoming inconvenient, right? Or when it's no longer fun uh, to have that around? So uh, I find that kind of um, uh, ironic. Uh, but But really what the book is about is forcing these conversations that I think our country probably needs to have. And, and the, the Satanists, as I see it, are merely the occasion for those important conversations. So I guess I'll jump right into it. And on that note that um, you talked about the monument going up, the Christian one. So uh, in response, they would say, OK, well, then you'll have to have this, too. Uh, so I usually do these talks with speakers um, like on history and anything related to social studies. So maybe economics or philosophy or religion. And I usually do it with students. But this was one I was like. Uh, I don't know if I want to talk about Satanism with my kids after school, but it's something I still think um, would be useful to put online. Anyway, to to get more to the point, how do you see uh, Satanism in schools right now? Or is there some sort of panic? Um, because as far as I can tell, when we look at some places like maybe Oklahoma, um, there is kind of like Christianity creeping into, uh, what do you want to say, the public sector. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the 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 Satanic Temple, um, everything that they do is in response to very specific legal decisions from the Supreme Court, right? So so that's sort of, they take those decisions and then they say, okay, but then if we were to logically extend that, then, then we could do this, right? Um, for the situation with, with Christians in schools, I mean, to be clear, America is, America is still a predominantly Christian country. And if you go to a school like Oklahoma, most of those students are going to be Christian and they're going to have constitutional rights to practice their religion. The issue is when the government becomes a platform for indoctrinating or promoting a particular form of, of religion. So the Supreme Court has said you have to have a moment of silence. And if students choose to pray, they can. But you can't just say we're all going to pray. Right. Um, you can read the Bible in public schools for its historical value, but you can't read it in a devotional way, right? Um, so where you get gray areas is there's this group called the Good News Club, and they are nominally a Christian after-school program, and they like to hold meetings in schools after the end of the school day. And some people complain, and they said, this is very confusing to children about whether or not this message is coming from a private ministry or it's coming from the public school. And, and supposedly kids have come home and said things like, if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll go to hell. And they told me that at school and everything that they tell me in school is true. You know, I, I don't know if that really happened, but that sort of demonstrates that the problem. What the Supreme Court has said is, if you cannot discriminate against the Good News Club just because they are Christian, and if you're not going to let them come and do this after school, then you have to have a rule that no outside group can meet after school. So if you get rid of the Good News Club, that means no Boy Scouts, no, you know, whatever other type of, of, of group might be there. The other thing is that a lot of schools have a practice of closing early on certain days. So the parents really need for them to be some kind of programming going on after school. So this is where the Satanists inserted themselves in the situation and created the After School Satan Club as a kind of answer to the Good News Club. And I think their point was really, do you see how uncomfortable it makes you knowing that there are people at your public school that you paid for with tax dollars promoting Satanism? That's how we feel 
right, about the Good News Club. And I think the point that they want to try to steer people towards is maybe it would be better if just religious, you know, after school programs happened in churches or recreation centers or really anywhere but in the school uh, uh, where kids are, are getting their education. Um, as far as the actual content, I know they teamed up with um, uh, people who design content for uh, uh, an atheist or secular summer camp. Um, so the students are not, it's not like the Good News Club in that the Good News Club actually studies Christianity and studies the Bible. Uh, the After School Satan Club does not study the philosophy of Satanism or practice satanic rituals. They actually are studying like you know, bullying or how bats navigate with sonar or these kinds of fun, normal projects for, for, for kids. Uh, so they're playing this kind of strategy, which I don't know if it's a successful one, where they're saying there's not, we're not actually doing anything objectionable, but we also do want you to be freaked out that Satanists now have access to your kids, right? So they're always kind of trying to have it both ways where they expect their opponents to panic but then they want their opponents to look silly for panicking for, for no reason. Um, at first, these after-school Satan clubs weren't really going anywhere because, well, the biggest obstacle was nobody wanted to enroll their kids in something called the after-school Satan club. There's no kids. Um, but the other problems were uh, schools would just stonewall. They found, well, if we just never answer the phone or we never answer our mail, then even though we're not allowed to discriminate against certain viewpoints, we can still de facto do that anyway. And we know that these Satanists only have so much time and money uh, uh, to dedicate to this. And then the third thing was um, to, to be around kids at a public school, you need all kinds of background checks and you need uh, insurance, you need a lot of insurance. And some of the insurance companies were not willing to do business uh, with Satanists. Uh, so that was also a factor. But in recent years, it has been revived and they actually have been able to have meetings of this and the ACLU has gotten involved and it's become a big thing. And, you know, people are very, very upset. Um, you know, David Frankfurter um, wrote a book called Evil Incarnate um, about kind of the way that people imagine evil with a capital E. And he doesn't mean like the Holocaust is evil or genocide is evil. He means the idea of just pure evil for evil's sake, things like people imagining witchcraft or, or uh, 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 black masses or, or Satanism. And he, he, he believes this is kind of um, a recurring idea across history because it sort of helps the society to kind of, um, kind of join ranks against a common enemy. But he says these claims are always the same, whether we're talking about the Middle Ages and witches or even claims about Jews spreading plague or whatever, but evil is always parasitical. Evil always corrupts our innocence, right? Um, and so I think the just saying uh, Satan and children together in the same sentence is really going to make people's blood pressure shoot through the roof. <laughs> and I think the Satanic Temple calculated uh, on that. I do think, though, that they sometimes don't realize just how powerful a symbol Satan is for a lot of Christians. I, I, sometimes I think they they really underestimate how profound the reaction is that they are eliciting from, from some people. Because I've had college students who say, um, can I can I not come to class the day that we're discussing Satanism? Um, just, just saying the word makes me feel nauseous. And I don't physically know how I'd be able to get through, uh, you know, a 60 minute discussion uh, of it. And I think for the Satanic Temple, they're like, yeah, it's Satan, it's, it's, it's hilarious, right? Or there might be some real kind of convictions and values behind it, but the, the idea of Satan as kind of the cosmic enemy of humanity is just so far from their way of thinking. I think they're often forgetful uh, of how other people perceive this. Yeah. So uh, just to give some background on myself, um, I actually came from a very like Protestant background and half my family was also Catholic. And I actually went to Good News Club. How you describe it is literally perfect because I remember um, when I first came across the Satanism and I learned about the statue, I think I might have been in college. And um, I remember just feeling so ill, but then the more you learn about some of these, you're like, oh, they're actually don't even believe in the devil. They don't even believe in God. They're just like um, atheists. Sorry if I'm simplifying that because, you know, you're the religious scholar, but um, it was interesting to find so much more and uh, kind of how many misconceptions I had. Can you tell me a little bit about some of the biggest misconceptions on Satanism? 
Sure. I mean, I think the biggest misconception is actually fairly reasonable, which is that most Satanists don't worship Satan. Right. And I honestly can't be that angry at people for being confused about that. It's very confusing. I, right? I didn't know either. Yeah. I didn't yeah. Know. And, and you know, the, the Satanists are like, well, do Pentecostals worship Pentecost or, you know, um, but but Satanism came about, um, you know, in in the 60s. Um, in the 60s, everybody thought religion was dying. They thought, you know, maybe we've got a few more years of religion and then we're going to be like Star Trek. Everybody was watching Star Trek in the 60s, right? Uh, people weren't necessarily happy about this. They just figured that was the way things were going. And there was this big occult revival with the 60s counterculture of, you know, this is the beginning of, of Wicca and astrology is getting really popular and, and stuff like that. And this movie comes, a novel comes out in 1967 called Rosemary's Baby about witches sort of, you know, uh, having the Antichrist baby. And it becomes a movie and the movie's huge. It's the first horror movie to win an Oscar, right? And there's this guy, Anton LaVey, and he lives in San Francisco. And he's just, I, Anton LaVey, if he lived today, he would have been a podcaster. He would have had a highly successful podcast that just talked about spooky stuff. But in, in San Francisco, you could go to his house and you could pay $2 and he would give you a lecture on vampires or something like that. And somebody suggests to him, you know, you could start your own religion. And eventually um, someone from Avon Books said, you know, we there's this novel, Rosemary's Baby. We sold so many copies. It's about witchcraft. You know about all this spooky stuff. You write a book. You write us a book that we could sell. So he says, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So he writes the Satanic Bible. And that's where the, the same table was basically commissioned, right, by a literary agent to sell to hippies interested in spooky stuff, right? Um, so in that book, there is some genuine philosophy in there, but Anton LaVey was, you know, he did not believe in God or the devil. Um, he he had kind of, you know, some people say he had kind of woo-woo ideas about uh, kind of what he called magic, right? But for him, magic is just sort of... Um, almost kind of like the power of positive thinking or something right if you if you want something and you kind of know how people work you can you can make make it happen right um but he did have he did have some things that were very appealing in the 60s he said you know christianity has taught you to be uh to, to be humble to be um, um to to be ashamed of your sexual desires so on i want a religion that's about kind of acting really human about embracing your pride about embracing um you know who who you are uh, uh sexually uh if someone has wronged you and you're mad at them it's okay to be angry at them right and there were always limits right he never said you can just go kill somebody but you could you know you could do like a hex ritual on them and maybe make yourself feel better or something like that he said he said rituals were uh decompression chambers right the other thing about anton levey is he he said that he used to work at a circus and that he um, he had this insight into, uh, you know, being a carnival barker and manipulating people. So it was never clear with the Church of Satan, was he serious about this? Or was he kind of manipulating people who wanted to become a, a, a Satanist, right? Um, so anyways, that becomes kind of Satanism. And pretty much every other tradition of Satanism that exists today came along after Anton LaVey. They may say they're thousands of years older, but it's not true. Right. As far as we can tell, they're pretty much all embedded after Anton LaVey. And so groups like the Satanic Temple borrowed a lot from Anton LaVey. Their politics are quite different. So Anton LaVey was a was a libertarian. Uh, he led he read lots of Ayn Rand. Um, Satanic Temple are very progressive, very kind of they're, they're not officially socialist in their policies, but many members of it uh, are. Um, and then you had groups who said, well, I, I actually think, why are we doing hex rituals? Why are we doing magic if there's not really a Satan? Um, and so you had a group that came out of the Church of Satan called uh, the Temple of Set. And, and they're in some ways much more like a traditional religion. They said there are supernatural forces. There is a being that hears us if we do these, these rituals. But it's not Satan. It's actually this entity that was known in Egypt as Set, the god of darkness. And they believed that the Hebrew word Satan is a corruption of Set. Um, so in some ways, they're, they're theistic Satanists. They're more kind of what uh, people would imagine 
when they when they think of a, a Satanist and they do practice magic and and, and things like this. Um, but for all of that, they're um, they're not um, they're not criminal. They don't involve in, in criminal activity. And actually, um, the the former high priest of the Temple of Set lives in Austin, and I had him come meet my my class. And his day job was he works um, in a he basically works with incarcerated women. He works at a women's prison and helps them get their GEDs. And I said to him, you know. Some people might say that your job is pretty compassionate and <laughs> your job involves kind of helping people and it doesn't really jive with the kind of, you know, Nietzschean will to power rhetoric of your church, right? And, and his answer to that was kind of, well, you know, we need to be on a fair playing field and my, you know, my, my students need to have a, a fair shot in order to compete, right? And so that's that, that, that's why I do this. Uh, so, so those are kind of some of the major groups. There are very nasty forms of Satanism out there, right? Um, serial killer Richard Ramirez, for example, this, he described himself as a, as a Satanist. He was alone. He did, he wasn't part of a community of Satanists. But um, you know, it, as a religious studies scholar, when people say they're part of a religion, I pretty much take them at their word. You know, um, so I don't think Satanists should be judged by Richard Ramirez in the same way I don't think Muslims should be judged by ISIS. Uh, but I still think that that he counts. Um, there is a group called the Order of the Nine Angles that has connections to neo-Nazism and has supported human sacrifice and has basically said, um, if you're not doing human sacrifice, you can't call yourself a, a Satanist. Um, they have not, as far as I've known, actually done a human sacrifice. <laughs> they seem to be kind of edgelords in their, their basement. Um, but this group has metastasized with the rise of sort of um, neo-Nazi movements in, in the last few years. Uh, and so there's been some very disturbing cases. So in my, my most recent book, um, there was a, a member of this group who was in the U.S. military. He gave his location details and security details for his unit um, uh, to uh, Al-Qaeda and basically said, come kill all these American soldiers and this will be my human sacrifice, right? I am responsible for the deaths of these people and it's a, it's a human sacrifice. And uh, of course the US military will intercept messages like that. So, so he was caught and at his trial, um, his lawyer basically used the dumbass defense and said the order of nine angles is such a stupid, pathetic religion that the fact that my client joined it shows he doesn't know anything, right? And you shouldn't judge him too harshly, right? And the judge said, I have read the rhetoric of the Order of Nine Angles, and the goal of human sacrifice for this group is ultimately to destroy society itself so some new order can emerge with totally different morals. And, and your target here wasn't just your fellow soldiers, it was human civilization, <laughs> right? Um, now, I will say one more thing. I mean, first of all, I don't, we shouldn't all like worry about the order of nine angles, right? This is mostly a bunch of, you know, uh, I think un, uh, white men whose moms didn't love them enough probably <laughs> uh, 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 behind this, right? Uh, but I also think that um, paradoxically, the kind of paranoid conspiracy theories about Satanism and what Satanists do inspired this group. Right. In other words, they're, they're not taking their cues from Anton LaVey. They said Anton LaVey was a silly old man in San Francisco. They're taking their cues from Christians saying, you know, satanic conspiracy theories are everywhere and the Illuminati controls everything and they're deadly people and they do human sacrifice. So uh, I think we should be cautious, right, when we kind of uh, uh, spread these rumors lest we give rise to, to groups like the, the Order of Nine Angles. So, so they're out there, but the overwhelming majority of Satanists uh, basically see Satan as their favorite fictional character, kind of in the way that I like Batman or something, right? And Batman can inspire you, even if you know that Batman is just a character and it's it's not real. So for them, Satan, and this is not the Satan of the Bible, this is the Satan of Milton and the Romantic Poets. The values that it personifies are, um, you know, self-determination, independence, um, never giving up, no matter how tough the odds are, et cetera. That's what Satan means to them, not the enemy of all mankind that it means to Christians. Yeah. And that's from Paradise Lost. Yeah. So, so Milton's Paradise Lost, Milton wanted, um, 
he wanted an epic for Christianity the way that the Iliad is an epic uh, uh, for Greek culture. And so he took this story of, of the, the, the war in heaven, which really isn't in the Bible, right? That, that if we would expect, um, you know, Genesis to begin, and then before Adam and Eve, there was a big war in heaven. It's not there, right? You have to kind of read between the lines of the Bible to, to find this story. So he, he writes it out. And, and you know, I, when I talk about this with my students, I say it's, it's kind of like um, the Avengers movies, right? The big bad in the Avengers movies is Thanos, but Thanos is misguided, right? He wants to do good. He wants to help the universe, but the way that he's doing it is really callous and destructive. You have to do that as a good storyteller. If, you're, if your bad guy is just evil for the sake of being evil, it's not a good story, right? It's a much better story if there is something noble about them that's been perverted. So that's what Milton did. Milton, I don't think, ever wanted to make people like Satan, but he did kind of give Satan some good qualities. You know, Satan is noble. And what the Satanists really admire is Milton Satan never, ever backs down, right? Uh, because, I mean, he's he's going to lose, right? He's been condemned to hell for thousands of years. And he's just kind of like, is, is that the best you got? Condemning me to hell for eternity, right? And, and there's a speech which they use in their rituals sometimes where he says something like, um, basically, if, if, you, if you send me to hell, I'm going to make hellfire my weapon and that I will... I will come back at you with, you know, I can't, it's really poetic language, like black fire and infernal siege weapons or something like that, right? And it sounds really badass. And I think Milton just wanted to have a compelling villain for his epic. But not long after Milton, some people, especially Europeans who were frustrated with the monarchy or frustrated with the authority of the Catholic Church, identified with Satan in that story and said, Satan is standing up to God, a tyrant, in the same way that we're standing up to, you know, the king of France, right? So people like Victor Hugo uh, became very kind of sympathetic towards Satan, at least as a literary character. And it's out of that moment that the kind of seeds of uh, uh, Satanism kind of begin. I understand you said, like, this wasn't the only thing you're focused on, like, you like religious studies in general, and it just kind of... Uh maybe fell onto you for other reasons, but what were some of like the biggest challenges you ran into um, studying Satanism and writing a book, um, especially coming from that like Christian background? Like how was that perceived at like Thanksgiving dinner or something like? Yeah. I mean, I don't usually tell people that I'm you know, writing a, a book about Satanism. I was, I was asked to review this book. This is from Oxford University Press and the Journal of the American Academy of Religion said, can you write a review of it? Well, I had a student come in this afternoon. It's his first semester of college. He wants to write a paper on the Gospel of Mark. And he was like, what, what's that on your desk? Right? Mm -hmm. I had to be like, it's okay. Like, you know, this isn't God's not dead. Like, you know, I'm just reviewing it. But yeah, people are people are very uh, uh, worried about it. Um, my wife actually has often said that I was doing this work in, in situations where I think she probably shouldn't have, have said it, right? Um, so that's one part of it. And I think a lot of people assumed I must be a Satanist because why else would I would I write about uh, a Satanism, right? The other thing that's come out of it is um, Satanists don't work well together. They don't play well with others. And some ex-members of the Satanic Temple are really, um, really dedicated to just sort of burning down the Satanic Temple on the internet, right? Uh, and so I have I have taken a lot of kind of collateral damage from that. And I think their logic is, I think it's this horrible group because I had a bad time there. And your book doesn't say it's a horrible group. Therefore, you're with the enemy. So occasionally I will get, you know, really nasty tweets uh, directed at me on Twitter from somebody with some ridiculous name, you know, like whatever, Darth Vader or something like that. Who's a, who's a Satanist who doesn't like the Satanic Temple and, and wants to kind of give me an earful or tell tell me I'm not a real academic, I'm a propagandist or something like that. That is actually pretty common for anyone in my field who does new religious movements. These groups are controversial, and so a lot of people will make that assumption that if you didn't totally bash the group, you must be you know on the payroll or, or, or something like that. So yeah, I get I get heat from Christians, I get heat from Satanists. <laughs> it's not fun <laughs> yeah well, that's yeah that's like the life you sign up for yeah it's funny because when I actually got this book um I remember my wife looking at like the Amazon account she's like are you okay like what are you doing I'm like it's it's not what you think because uh I'm a Christian too but it was just 
funny almost having to explain yourself to be like, you know, I just like studying religion. I like social studies. Right. Well, the argument that I would use is if you're alarmed about after school Satan clubs or building statues of the devil and so forth, you, you should read the book and then you'll have an informed opinion about it. Right. And you, you may still conclude this is dangerous or these people are scoundrels or, or whatever, but at least it'll be informed. After people read your book, what do you hope that they get out of it? If there's one or a couple things that you're like, man, this is like the whole point. I hope they take this away from the book. I, mean, I want them to understand that um, religion is what we call a second order category, right? It's, it's, I think a lot of people assume you have to believe in a supernatural entity to be considered a religion, and that is not legally true, right? Supreme Court has explicitly rejected that. And as Lucian Greaves would say, like, so if I were actually a devil worshiper, I would have more rights, you know, than being part of this kind of uh, a, a weird group, but but one that's that's kind of uh, a harmless. So that's the big one. I want people to understand what a complicated, loaded term religion is and how people play games saying, oh, the Satanic Temple, they're not a religion, they're trolls, or they're political theater, but a Ten Commandments monument, that's not religion, that's that's history. So people make all these weird kind of divisions, and if they could just see how that's how that game is played, uh, I would be super happy. The other thing is, uh, I want people to kind of be open to the possibility that the the Satanic Temple, um, they may have begun as a joke, they may have begun as political theater, but I don't think that that's what they are anymore, and I don't think that that's a realistic assessment of of, of what they are now. I think for them. Uh, they're quite serious about this. And I think it's possible for something to start off with kind of silly means and actually become something quite uh, uh, sincere. Um, I talk in the book about ignorant familiarity, but I think a lot of people have read an article or two on the internet and they feel like they know all there is to know about this this group. And, and that's not really true. If you go out and talk to them or observe them, you, you see that it's, it's actually something much more uh, complex and serious than that. What's your favorite part of history? My favorite part of history. Oh, wow. Uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, can I say the Viking age? I mean, I feel like that's such a bearded white guy answer. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, I played Dungeons and Dragons and I, I, I love going to Ren fairs and uh, I've even gone around the world on a, on a ship. Um, so if there's something that kind of gets me excited uh, uh, from history, maybe that's that's what I would say. Especially since now we we know Vikings were basically you know kind of entrepreneurs and very culturally uh, curious about the world, right? And and not just uh, uh, pillagers. Why would you say history is important? Well, history is incredibly important, right? As George Santayana, I think, who said, uh, "Those who who forget history are, are doomed to repeat it," right? Um, I think that we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. There's a lot of what I could be saying about uh, our current political moments um, in the United States. Even in my own work on satanic panic, um, it's very clear that these claims that your neighbor is a witch or your neighbor is a Satanist, they show up at very particular moments in history. And if we don't study history, we'll never know why people do this. We'll never crack the pattern because it doesn't have to be this way. Humans have a tendency towards paranoia. We're not paranoid all the time. We have to figure out what's causing us to act this way. And we can only do that using uh, historical research. Can you offer some piece of advice for history students? So this might be at the college level or even the high school level. I think something that my students often get kind of blown away with when they start doing historical research is when they realize that we're at the mercy of the archivists, right? We only know what someone in the past thought was important and thought to write down or thought to include in the archive. So we don't know what we don't know. We're very limited uh, uh, by that. And of course, we have no reason, there's any number of reasons why somebody in the past might have thought uh, one letter is worth preserving and another one isn't. Or, well, you know, Jesus said probably hundreds of things all day long, every day, but only some of those things got written down. Right. Why'd they pick the things that they did and not something else? Right. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. And I think a lot of people, it, it never occurs to them when they begin doing historical research. And then my last one, um, resources that are helpful for learning more about uh, religion. So like any websites or like archives online, anything that because uh, like I love studying religion. So 
Anything that's helpful? Yeah, so some resources for religion. Um, sacredtext.com is a really fun site. They collect uh, all kinds of religious texts in English translations broadly construed. So not just from the major world religions, but from weird little uh, uh, sects or kind of eccentric mystics or all kinds of stuff. There's, there's just no end to what you can find on sacredtext.com. Um, the World Religion and Spirituality Project is run by um, David Bromley at Virginia Commonwealth University, and they have profiles on new religious movements. So if you want an unbiased source about Scientology or the Satanic Temple or the Branch Davidians or the Raelians or any of these things that you see Netflix shows on, um, that's a great place to go. There's going to be a timeline for all these movements. It's going to be written by a scholar who's an expert in the field. They're going to have references at the bottom with more resources for you. Um, and a third site would be uh, pluralism.org, which is run by uh, the Pluralism Project at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, but they map out religious groups. So if you wanted to know something like how many Hindu temples are there in Houston, right? You could go and you could you could find that out. Or uh, is there a Wiccan coven in San Marcos, Texas, right? You, you could go and find that information. And for a lot of those groups, uh, there are there are profiles. And I think that they still give out student research grants. Um, so that actually might be something your students might want to know about in the future, but uh, possibly uh, uh, getting a couple thousand dollars to kind of um, add to what we know about the American religious landscape and making a profile or something to go up on that website. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Have a good one. Okay, you too. Yeah, you well.